Two. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Brady Ryan, manager at Comotion Labs, and I hope that you find this new series on hardware entrepreneurship as fantastic as we think it's going to be. Comotion Labs at UW is a multi-industry incubation environment for Seattle and UW's innovation community. We provide critical infrastructure like desks, wet lab space, and prototyping space, as well as critical education, mentoring, and networking. I like to think of it as the best version of co-working available, where we do everything we can to support early stage startups. We don't take equity. We don't take any sort of IP position. Uh, we just exist to provide co-working and incubation for the best startups in Seattle. You may have heard of two of our spaces, Startup Hall, which focuses on software and IT, and Flu Call, which focuses on life science and anything that takes place in a wet lab. Uh, but I am very excited to announce that we are on the cusp of opening a third space focused on hardware startups. We heard from you guys in the community that hardware startups need more love and resources here in town, and we're happy to jump in and join the fight. So what does co-working look like at Hardware Hall? Uh, for our members, we provide both desks for programming and bookkeeping and emails and workbenches for prototyping and wrenching on the stuff you're working on. Uh, we have shared equipment like a suite of 3D printers and SLA printers, a laser cutter, and an entire circuitry rework area. We have conference rooms, phone booths, and coffee. Uh, and we also have connections to a bunch of machine shops around campus that you can use to get stuff done. Um, and we're building a lot of relationships with service providers, vendors, and design shops across the region so we can plug you into the right people at the right time. Uh, we'll do what we can to help you raise money, prototype, and learn what you need, and to find the right mentors when you need them. Uh, soon, we'll have a soft opening, and we'll be adding a few companies here and there as we iron out the wrinkles uh, and stay empty enough to navigate COVID safely. Um, so we're off on a new adventure supporting hardware startups. Uh, I'd love to talk to anyone to hear your thoughts. We're still early, and we have a lot of decisions to make and directions to explore, and your perspective would be invaluable. I'll put my email in the chat, um, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Harinderpal Hansball, or Hans to his friend. Uh, Hans is the leader of a fantastic meetup group called the IoT Hub, and he is as well networked in the space and as helpful as anyone I've met. Uh, if anyone here doesn't know Hans, do yourself a favor and reach out. Hans. Thank you, Brady. Uh, as Brady mentioned, I lead the uh, Seattle-based IoT Hub meetup group. Um, we exist to bring together the local tech and business communities to connect, share, and learn how IoT and Industry 4.0 technologies will shape our lives, communities, jobs, and industries, because they do affect all of those. Um, the group has been in existence for about four and a half years, and we just passed our 3,800th member. Um, so we're approaching 4,000 members. Uh, the members include students, entrepreneurs, industry experts, and uh, senior executives from technology, industrial, and manufacturing companies, many of them local here. Uh, we strive to bring speakers with real world experience as opposed to just talking about the technology. Uh, speakers have included many IoT leaders and entrepreneurs representing everything from startups to global industrial and technology companies. Uh, our meetups cover topics uh, with the usual IoT buzzwords, edge computing, 5G, edge cloud platforms, digital twins, physical cyber systems, and most importantly, security. Uh, we also uh, devote quite a bit of time to industrial IoT and industry 4.0 topics, um, things like uh, additive manufacturing, intelligent maintenance and field service, robotics, industrial automation. Um, and we actually have a meetup coming up tomorrow on uh, 5G and IoT innovation. Um, most recently, uh, we started a series of meetups to help IoT and connected hardware startups and entrepreneurs on their journey. Many IoT and industry 4.0 startups um, have to build hardware as part of their value proposition. Uh, the good news is that according to Bloomberg and CB Insights, investments in uh, hardware startups increasingly take a larger share of uh, total VC investments, 43% uh, uh, last year. Uh, however, almost three quarters of hardware startups fail and never make it past the second round. 97% uh, of them fail altogether and three quarters never uh, make it past their second round. And in Seattle, as we all know, the startup ecosystem um, is uh, quite lacking for hardware uh, startups uh, compared to the vibrant software ecosystem we have. So I'm quite excited about partnering with uh, Commotion Labs, Brady and Caroline 
um, and look forward to participating in uh, more of these and uh, uh, hopefully building a uh, hardware startup ecosystem that's deep, as deep and wide as uh, software in Seattle. Um, you can check out our community on meetup.com. Just search for IoT Hub in Seattle. There are a few IoT Hubs around the world. Uh, we're the ones in Seattle. Uh, we're always looking for speakers and welcome anyone interested in uh, sharing their experience. Uh, before I hand it back to Brady, uh, we have uh, uh, just a few announcements. Um, next Wednesday, Chrissy Meyer from uh, Root Ventures, uh, which is a seed stage hard tech venture capital firm, uh, will present business models for hardware companies um, and investors' perspective. Chrissy spoke at Fundamentals for Startup last year, last fall, and her talk was one of the uh, most popular of the year. And I went to that. It was very helpful, uh, especially if you're a hardware startup. All of uh, Commotion fundamentals for hardware startups will be archived on the commotion website under labs and startup training videos through their speaker series commotion has covered a variety of topics over the past several years so if you find yourself with some free time check them out they're pretty good uh, you'll learn a lot uh, for the full schedule and to register for future events uh, please visit uh, commotion.uw.edu slash events and uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, really quick note on questions. Um, in case the chat function is a little wonky for folks, you can feel free to send me an email and I'll get the questions passed along. My email is B as in boy, S as in Sam, Ryan, R-Y-A-N, at uw.edu. If the chat function is working for you, go ahead and use that. Uh, but if it's not, shoot me an email and we'll get that answered, hopefully. So on to our speaker. Uh, today, John Murkowski is here to present product development process from dreams to mass production. John graduated from UW with a degree in mechanical engineering. He's a serial entrepreneur, having started four companies. Pensar was founded in 2001 and is, and is his most successful with its stellar reputation and fantastic team of 90 talented engineers and designers. John and his co-founder, Clint Schneider, have cultivated the great Pensar working environment focused on client success paired with a culture of excellent work-life balance. John is a proud husband to his climbing sweetheart of 25 years and a father of young twins. Uh, John will take questions via the chat if it's working or through my email if it's not. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. John's happy to answer them as they pop up. And I will now turn the event over to John. Thanks, Brady. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, I'm John Murkowski, I'm the original founder of Pensar. Uh, what you see now on your screen is the view from our office where we used to be able to work um, downtown. Um, but stepping through here, so uh, Pensar was founded in 2001, trying to go uh, do product development uh, a little bit different, uh, much more focused on the client side of it. Uh, we're currently uh, 85 plus humans five to 10 dogs on an average day, split amongst uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software, firmware, industrial design, FPGA, uh, a wide range of different uh, skill sets and unique individuals that allow us to go uh, target product development across the board. We've been fortunate in the last 20 years to get a chance to work with a lot of different clients. Uh, we started out as a mostly pure uh, medical device design company, um, obviously focused in the mechanical side because that was my background, uh, but we've been able to go expand that um, into three pretty distinct areas. One is uh, still medical device design and uh, professional grade products. Uh, the second one is uh, consumer electronics, um, Xboxes, uh, neat toys you go buy at the, at the store type of thing. And the last one is uh, a recent push to try to go put uh, really cool stuff up in space. So um, those are kind of the three markets that we go target that our experience is based off of. So as I said, we started as a medical device design company. Uh, we've been fortunate to work with Philips, uh, Siemens, Sonosite, Fuji, uh, lots of different companies. A lot of our processes that we're gonna talk about today is the result of being able to go into a lot of these companies and um, kind of pull the, the best uh, practices from each one and uh, kind of throw away the stuff that doesn't work and talk about it from a much more uh, functional standpoint and not just 
from what a process uh, says to go do. Uh, we've had a long-term partnership with Microsoft, uh, 10 plus years. Uh, we've gotten to do, uh, I think, uh, seven or eight Xboxes in a row for them. Uh, a lot of fun, very, very different uh, design requirements. Um, when you start talking about uh, the fact that Christmas never changes, it doesn't slide in the schedule, um, and you, you need X amount of uh, product per week coming out at quantities that are difficult to imagine from a design standpoint. When you're doing a million per week, it changes the, the whole design concept and, and the layout of what you're doing. And then the third category I mentioned that we do a lot of work in is, is aerospace and trying to put cool stuff up into space. Um, all of that is confidential until it comes back to the Earth. So, um, But it's been a fun, fun challenge for us. Uh, so I wanted to kind of put up an eye chart for folks and take a look at... Uh, a really complicated, if you came to our office, this is a 40 foot long printout that we put up on the wall that shows a full FDA process and all of the steps and all of the different phase gates and the hundreds of documents that have to be created to go get a uh, great idea from a medical standpoint all the way out into a hospital being used to treat people. Um, so it's a very um, long, lengthy, um, detailed process. Um, and a lot of it is applicable anytime we think about bringing a product out to market, but there's a, a chunks of it that we don't have to go do for consumer electronic versus chunks of it that are different for FA type of uh, requirements. Um, but I wanted to just start with, we're gonna, we're gonna go through a little bit simpler version of this um, in this presentation, but wanting to kind of give people a flavor of, you know, how many different steps and documents and loops there are for us to go through and create a, a medical device that's going to get approved by the FDA for usage. Um, this schedule, if you look out, is typically our portion of it is anywhere from, oh, 18 to 24 months. And the overall schedule can be anywhere from 24 to 48 months by the time they get that approval. So there's a significant amount of delay. One of the most common things that we see is by the time we get approval to go use it, we already have end of life components that we spec two or three years ago and we have to go back in and, and find replacements for those. But from a simple standpoint, I wanna walk you guys through a handheld product here uh, that we did a few years ago and walk through uh, that process. Uh, I'm sure it's a product nobody's seen before. Um, so this is an industrial grade uh, product intended to go um, tell you how clean or dirty a uh, food plant, processing plant is. Um, so uh, a lot of these plants will run 24 hours a day um, and three eight hour shifts and they have to get cleaned between each shift and make sure that that plant is still safe to go create our food. Um, so between those shifts, after they clean it, they will walk around and use this device to measure how clean or dirty that surface is. So I was going to, I intended to use it as an example uh, to walk through uh, from a little bit higher level that process. So when we think about a uh, product development process, um, there's really uh, four critical phases here. Um, and we'll go through each one today uh, in more detail. Uh, the first one being our discovery phase. And I like to think of product development, um, at least from my experiences, as being a little kid in a sandbox and I get to go create and play and make whatever I want in that sandbox. Um, so during that discovery, we are doing requirements definition, we're doing market research, we're trying to get to an agreement on what the MVP is, and it's not the most valuable product, it is the minimum viable product, what's the, what's V1 have to have. And so when I think about that in my sandbox analogy, I'm always trying to figure out what's a hard requirement, what's soft, where are the walls, how much sand do I have, what tools do I get to go play with, what technology is going to be, you know, appropriate for the, the, the device um, and try to go get that uh, level of understanding of what my requirements are. What do I get to actually go, go work with? Um, once we can get all of the stakeholders to kind of a, an 80% level, kind of the 80-20 rule here on what those requirements are and what that MVV product should be, 
that allows us to leave discovery and, and spend more money. And these phases go up exponentially in cost and effort and time. So we want to make, you know, I, I use the the analog for people that, uh, for me to develop or for Pensar to develop a product, we need to go make 10,000 mistakes in order to get the right product out. And the faster we can make those mistakes, the better off we're going to be. The less money we're going to spend, the faster the schedule is going to be. So we're trying to get as much of that on the upfront side of it long before we start having uh, big schedule, schedule impacts, big cost changes. Um, so if we can get to that 80% requirements definition, um, you know, my favorite requirements documents are written with a priority. There are must-haves, there are nice-to-haves, there are uh, requirements that are only there if they're free um, and they come for no, no cost um, and trying to get that priority. I don't, we don't need the requirement to be fully defined at this point. It's okay if it says it's a TBD, um, but we need to know that the question is pertinent, that we don't want to, you know, not know what we don't know. Um, so we want to, even if we don't know what the requirement should be, we don't know, you know, how far it has to survive drop. Um, so we want to go at least put the drop requirement in there and leave it as a TBD. And that gets us to that kind of 85, 80% range where we know what we don't know and we can go try to affect that during our design and go try to tease out what that requirement should be. All right, so uh, let's see, digging into phase one discovery um, as we go through this. Um, a lot of it is, you know, for this product on the left here, you're seeing their, their old product, their existing one uh, that they want to obviously update. Um, we're looking at some of our market research, trying to understand what the user is doing, um, where they're using it. Uh, are they using it in, in a chicken processing plant like the center, or are they using it at the hostess Twinkie factory on the right? And how are they going to go use it? And trying to get all of those um, high risk unknown areas defined. Uh, we use a the FMEA process to help us uh, fully define those risks um, and be able to go categorize them and rank them so that we know which, from a Pareto chart standpoint, which risks we need to go solve first. In order to leave this phase, um, all the stakeholders need that kind of, you know, 80% type of agreement that they all think they know what product is going to be. And if we can get to that 80%, then let's go, let's go play in the next phase. Concepting, uh, this is what most people think about from product development. Um, sketches, block diagrams, playing with the you know, breadboards, uh, playing in the lab. This is that blue sky, everybody's brainstorming phase. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's what most people think product development is. And there is a portion of our, of our job here that is this. Um, and so we, we're going through that and our electrical engineers and our mechanical engineers are looking at technology. They're looking at what's going to be available. Is it going to be available in time? They're looking at energy densities, what chipset is going to be uh, right. Our industrial designers are working on you know, what the color materials and finish are, what the right branding is, what the human factors are going to be. Uh, our UI folks are walking through what the workflow is, what the screens are, what the um, cosmetics are there from a graphical standpoint. Um, mechanical engineers are starting to lay out their CAD, trying to give, you know, framework for everybody else to work around, um, give, you know, the electrical engineers enough board space to give ID, you know, a framework that they can start sketching on. And our goal here is to get down to three or five concepts that we're pretty certain will all be rejected. Um, and you'll hear this a couple of times. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, showing people what they don't want. Um, and so uh, when you ask for something and you think you, you document it really well and you've got your ask right, it's always an interpretation and uh, what comes back sometimes is exactly what you asked for. And uh, the moment you start using it, you realize that you didn't fully understand the problem and you need to ask it slightly different. So in this concept phase, we want, you know, enough valid concepts that at the end of it, we can um, try to down select uh, down into one single concept. And like I said, it's usually not any of the ones we present. It's a combination of 
uh, a little bit of concept one, a little bit of concept two, and all the colors from concept five, uh, or however that is. Um, it's usually a combination of those concepts. Um, those high risk things that we started to identify, we go back, we look at those again. We don't have them solved yet, but we now have a mitigation plan for those those highest risk items um, and what they were and how we how we think we're going to be able to go go solve those. And again, here at this stage, everyone thinks they know what the product's going to be. And again, here as we move into phase three, we've got this down selected concept. Uh, now we're going to start spending real dollars and real schedule. Uh, we're going to start expanding the team. We're going to add more engineers, more people to it, um, more project managers uh, as we start cranking through all of the details. And our end goal of this is to get to a uh, pre-production equivalent type of prototype. And most of the time that's a single prototype or a couple of them um, that's fully functional, fully cosmetic. There are times when there, there are multiple prototypes where we've got, we don't have the uh, electronics small enough yet, the chipset's not available, we're still working off of a lab queen for functionality. And so there are times where we'll have a cosmetic only prototype and a, and a functional prototype that are different. But our goal is to have those be the same. And this is where the bulk of all of our risk mitigation is going on. Um, this is where we are designing out all of the feature sets that are going to have to go back and meet that requirements document. Um, and so we can go look at that and say, oh, hey, the power on off button is required to work a million times. So we're going to go design a small little test kit, put it in our lab, run the pneumatic actuators and go test that a million times and then start trying to get that engineering confidence level for all of those requirements and the, the tests um, that are gonna have to be done. During this phase, uh, we're really trying to mitigate all of our identified DFMEA risks um, and go through that. We are building our alpha prototypes. So these are uncontrolled prototypes. Um, they are great for engineering confidence tests, uh, but we can't use them yet for, say, VNV or FCC or UL or CE regulatory testing. Uh, they're not controlled in how they were built, um, but they allow us to know what those answers are going to be ahead of time. So uh, there's a lot of design going on here. Uh, there's a lot of um, brainstorming smaller little details and not the big picture stuff. Uh, there's a lot of lab work. There's a lot of prototypes. Um, looking things up, verifying that we're getting what we expected. Uh, there is initial user validation going on of, you know, in this case, what the, the screens are and how that workflow happens. Um, and what we're after here in order to get out of our, of our phase three is really a fully functional alpha prototype that hopefully is also cosmetic. We could go hand to a marketing person and they wouldn't be able to tell it wasn't production. Um, it obviously isn't going to survive all of our tests, but uh, it's built in prototype processes with prototype materials. So it's it's not going to be as durable, but uh, they could go use it for Marcom. They could go use it to show off to clinical folks and to go start their testing. And at this point, we want to say the requirements are locked. There's no... There's no new requirements coming from, say, product marketing or from the client. And I put final in quotes here because the requirements are never final until the product ships. But we are, we're no longer uh, accepting input on what those requirements are without a dramatic change to schedule and cost. If we change requirements at this stage, um, we're going to go waste a lot of people's money and time in there. So if we can get to that alpha prototype, we can get to that final requirement documentation all the stakeholders are happy, then that allows us to move into our phase four of this, which is our pre-production uh, effort. And again, as I said, the, the costs are somewhat exponential as we go through these phases. Now that we have that, that fully functional alpha prototype, we can start working with the vendors. We can start getting all of the final detail design. We can do our design for manufacturing or do our design for assembly. Uh, we can really start tooling. We can start using um, ISO certified shops to assemble them and build them so that we can start doing our UL, CE, FCC testing. Um, these units can be used for verification and validation from an FDA standpoint. Um, they can be used for hardening testing from an FAA standpoint. Um, 
we are in that uh, initial ramp up of uh, pre-production units that um, we can go use to make sure that we have met all the requirements and that we are passing all of the, the regulatory requirements that are a part of that product. Um, for us to exit this and say we are done, um, which is a really exciting time because as we talked about, um, this is the minimal viable product. It's not V2. Um, what I try to tell our clients is that until we can exit phase four, you don't get any revenue. There's, there's nothing to sell. We can't go cost reduce a product you don't have. We can't go have V2 until you have V1. We can't go look at updating the requirement set until we have a set of requirements to go design around. So uh, really trying to push them into um, making some hard choices and uh, getting to that MVP product earlier and not later. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples of all time is when Apple first came out with their iPhone. Uh, it wouldn't send SMS. Uh, text messages, you couldn't send pictures, uh, and there was a lot of bad publicity and press that it was going to be a horrible failure because that wasn't in their V1, it wasn't part of their original MVP iPhone. Uh, turns out to not really matter that everybody was okay waiting. Um, so I think, you know, it's always back to that that time to market and how much revenue and, and lost opportunity are you by uh, taking on by adding those extra features. Uh, so yeah, for us to get out of phase four exit, there is a clear manufacturing ramp. We have all of our, our regulatory uh, approvals. Uh, we've mitigated all of our uh, DFMEA risks. Um, we can now release the final product requirements. Um, and sometimes that testing is what changes the requirement. Uh, we might, as an example, have had a requirement for you know a drop from 36 inches, and we thought we were going to go past that, and our engineering confidence tests passed that. Uh, but when we actually got into the production environment, we see that we only passed from 32 inches. Instead of taking a six-month hit, uh, a lot of times that solution is to just go lower the requirement to what we can pass. So that's why it's, it's finally final when we ship. Um, the nice part about it is now everybody knows exactly what the product is going to be. Uh, there's no more uh, confusion between uh, anybody involved. Uh, they can pick it up, they can hold it, they can interact with it, they can ship it, they can sell it, um, they can go to trade shows. Everybody knows, good or bad, what that product is going to be. Real quick, this is Brady. Anybody that's listening along, uh, we have figured out the chat problem. You might need to refresh YouTube to get the chat back, but if you have any questions, go ahead, refresh and submit them and we'll get those answered. Thanks, John. Great, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, walking through a single product here and kind of showing those, those four phases. Um, from a top level standpoint. There is uh, more to it uh, when we go, once we get that production, then we can start talking about a fifth phase um, that I don't show here, but it's more sustaining. Uh, it varies a lot for some products. It is um, cost reduction, end of life issues, uh, service warranty improvements, um, ways to increase the margin um, on their product that's gonna happen in phase five. For some products, as soon as we ship uh, V1, uh, Phase five is immediately starting on what V2 is going to be. And depending upon how big of a change that is, we have to roll back into these phases uh, to a different level. But there's, uh, for most all the products we work on, there is a follow on phasing in there of that sustaining manufacturing support opportunities to increase the margins um, and start working on their, their V2 portion of it. So uh, Brady, that was my quick summary and then hoping to have, a, it sounds like uh, hopefully the, the chat's gotten fixed and we can have a little bit more interactive and take some questions from the folks out there on the line. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I did get one just now um, asking, at what point should a company start to engage with contract manufacturers, phase four, pre-production, et cetera? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> The, the common answer I give folks is that um, earlier is better, for sure. Uh, we can take a design to about 90, 95% completion. The last five to 10 is really vendor dependent. And so we can't do that last part until the vendor is selected. And it's a bit of a catch 22. If we get 
vendors involved super early, um, then they don't know what they're quoting on. We don't have enough resolution to give them accurate um, ideas. Um, everybody's kind of guessing about what we think it's going to be. So I really, towards the, the latter half of phase three here, um, start to think about bringing in those vendors, trying to have my vendor selection done. Uh, we've got enough detail here that they should be able to, to quote it, that we should be able to go evaluate whether or not their, their processes and their equipment are going to be able to do it, whether they have the right quality system. And that allows us throughout phase four to have them involved, to be getting their DFM, DFA feedback, and to be incorporating that early enough that it's not um, super painful if we wait all the way to the end and they've got a, a wonderful way that with their equipment, they can take 10 cents out of every part, but it takes us you know, 400 hours to redo the design, uh, then we've missed the right timing. So uh, typically uh, we wanna get them involved towards the latter part of our, our phase three and then have them selected and be a participant throughout our phase four pre-production efforts. Great. Uh, Jason Hoffman asked, in phase four pre-production, what is DFMEA? DFMEA uh, is uh, Design Failure Mode Engineering Analysis. Um, it's a wonderful tool that we use. You can use it for projects as well. Um, essentially, we get uh, all the stakeholders we can. Uh, whether they're manufacturing, whether they're service, whether they're business or engineering um, together. And we brainstorm risk to the design. Uh, and those could be, you know, hey, we've got the wrong requirement for liquid ingress um, or uh, management's not going to give us enough budget, whatever those risks are. Um, so we go brainstorm all of those risks and then we go uh, put a uh, value, say one to five, of the likelihood of that risk. And then we also put a value of the severity of one to five of that risk. So if it's a really high likelihood risk, it's going to get a likelihood of five. And if that means the project comes to a complete stop, it would get a severity of five. We go get to multiply those together and we get this cumulative score of say 25 for this imaginary risk. Um, we can then stack rank those and go look at what is the the Prater chart of risk to the to the design from both a likelihood and a severity standpoint. And it allows us to go focus in on the right risks at the right time and be able to go tackle them in order. You can't go mitigate all the risks at the same time. Um, so it gives us a chance to go say, yes, uh, what's a good example? Um, the risk that I'm driving down the road and my, my car door flies off. Well, the likelihood of that is really, really small. The consequence is probably pretty severe. Um, so when I multiply those out, it's nowhere near as uh, pertinent as a flat tire. So it gives me gives us the ability to go in there and um, organize the risk from a lot of different viewpoints and tackle them in the highest priority um, method. Great. Um, question, uh, if one were to start a new hardware company today, what would you focus on as the most valuable part of the company? For example, employees, infrastructure, patents, product, or something else. So uh, a big entrepreneurship question. <laughs> you know, uh, Pensar is a service company. We, uh, we give, well, we don't give, we, um, all the IP that we create is owned by our clients. Um, we don't have products. We don't have revenue streams from disposables or anything else. All we have is our people and we're only as good as the last project we've done. So for us, it's always been about the people. If I can surround myself with the smartest, best folks, um, I got a really good chance of being successful. Um, so for me, it's always been about the people and the people I get to work with. Uh, and I'd much rather have the A team and not have any patents than have the C team and have a bunch of patents. Um, so, uh, and I know there's companies that go both ways, but for me as a, as an entrepreneur, uh, I got to go to work. I got to go work with all these people. I get the opportunity to work with some awesome individuals. And that's the best part about Pensar. Great. Um, Shane Claggett asks, uh, how long do the various approvals typically take, FDA, FCC, UL, and how much do they typically cost? Do you see a wide variation depending on the details of the product? Uh, there is a fairly wide variation, particularly, say, on the FDA, but if we go to, like, normal regulation, regulatory, ULCE, you can do those both together. 
uh, in combined labs. Um, for most of our products, we're going to see somewhere, you know, three to five week turnaround and the lab's going to charge us fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to go through that process uh, it gets a little bit more complicated like if you're doing say custom lithium ion batteries you've got UNDOT shipping uh, regulatories for both the cell and the pack and so it adds another requirement if you're broadcasting you know over a certain uh, power requirement then the FCC changes their guidelines but for most of the products that you could go buy in a store, um, the regulatory part is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, four to six weeks, uh, $20,000 in testing fees and whoever's managing that process. Um, when you get into the FDA, uh, that can vary dramatically. Um, and it's always kind of interesting to me that, you know, there is not say an FDA approved process you, you follow. Um, you write a process, you get the FDA to approve it, and then you have to prove to the FDA that you followed the process they approved. So you can change your process at any time, as long as you get the FDA to go reapprove it. All you have to do is go prove to them that you followed the process um, in there. So it's not it's not a like a standard like an ISO standard is uh, for the process you have to follow. So um, it can vary dramatically based off of what class device it is, if it's implantable, uh, if you're leveraging previous known um, 510Ks and you're you know, saying by analysis it's equivalent, we're not changing the power into the person, uh, it's just for cosmetics that lowers the bar um, but the the high risk ones you know anything that we go and plant in somebody anything that um, is used for diagnostics so if we are doing an ultrasound device say for Philips and physicians are going to go make a diagnostic choice on a patient based off of the image that the machine creates then the bar is a lot higher um, likewise if we're going to go use uh, say ultrasound to treat somebody from a um, high food standpoint focused ultrasound um, then it's a much higher bar uh, for that hardware versus hey we want to go do a clarisonic device that's intended to make your skin softer and use these gels um, it doesn't have that diagnostic or that treatment component and it's obviously not implantable so the bars are a lot lower um, on the low end uh, that FDA process uh, six months uh, by the time a company steps through with their design history file and submits their 510k uh, all the way out to um, if you're doing human trials uh, and animal trials to go prove it from the beginning uh, four to five years we've got devices that you know we finished our design um, two plus years ago and uh, they're still in human trials waiting yeah that's always fun stuff um Question from Alexandra Hammerberg, who I have on good authority, is a fantastic UW student. Um, could you discuss balancing technology development with product development? Yeah, I think um, everybody talks like uh, that R&D is the same thing. And I think it's, um, it's important to go think about that, that they are two separate uh, terms for a reason. Um, there is research and there is development. Um, most people think product development is R&D, and um, it really uh, shouldn't be. Uh, like, we do a fair bit of research projects for our clients, um, and we set them up that way. Um, they're fun because, you know, the rubber never really has to meet the road. It's kind of like, you know, for me being back in school and like, hey, I'm going to go learn everything I can, document that, and I don't have to actually get to a finish line. It's nice if I do. If I find that, that's great. If I find out that it's not possible, that's fine too, um, versus productization, where the technology is proven, the technology is known, and now we need to go productize it into something that people will go buy. That is a much different portion of it. So I think um, technology development, um, there's a lot of companies uh, in Seattle and the, the Northwest and obviously everywhere that, that put a ton of focus into their labs, um, obviously the universities. That to me is much more of the technology development where it's coming from. You know, if you think about all the ultrasound in the world and it all coming out of UW long ago um, and then spinning off into ATL and then into all these different companies. Um, that's the technology development and then the productization is, is different. I would much rather, instead of thinking about it as R&D, 
think about it just like the question of hey there's a technology development side that is purely investment um, and then there is a productization side of these companies that is trying to go productize the technology because there's definitely times where you you find out some great piece of technology and don't know how to productize it. don't know who would want to buy it but it's really cool and so um, you see a lot of the the spin-offs that come out um, where there is a, a very concerted effort to try to figure out how to use that technology for uh, for market good, where people will go go buy it. Got a question from Stephen Morris that I really like. Uh, he asks, what role does the customer have in each phase? And what are some practical, effective techniques you use to control scope creep? So I guess, where does your client plug in appropriately? And how do you guys uh, avoid the issue we all seem to have of scope creep? Yes, feature creep, scope creep. Um, so uh, we are consultants. Um, we have an obligation to our clients uh, to educate them to the exact same level of understanding that we have, and then provide them the trade-off. At the end of the day, they have to decide how much risk they want to go take um, with it. We will fail our clients if we don't uh, get them that same level of education that we have on the subject. So, uh, and sometimes that's difficult. Uh, we may have a a client that's not sophisticated in product development, but it's really good on the finances. Um, and so there's, it's a longer education process to bring them up to speed and make sure they understand the, the implications of the decision they're, they're making. Um, but definitely looking at it from a, um, for us to proceed and for us to go into the next step, we definitely need the client to, to sign off on it um, and our customer. But we have this uh, ongoing continuous obligation to manage their expectation, to educate them to the same level of understanding that we have, and then allow them to go make the decision that's appropriate for them. Um, you know, we may have a, a client, for example, who who wants to accelerate their schedule and um, is asking for ways to do that. And we could say, hey, we have this round of prototype tooling, and then six weeks later, we're going to do production hardened steel tooling. You could release those at the same time. Your risk is that the production hardened tooling is going to be wrong and you're going to have to redo it. Your win for that is that you're going to be six weeks ahead if, if we didn't make any mistakes and we don't have any issues. Um, and so that's a trade off that with enough explanation, they can go decide which how much risk they want to take. Um, you know, we talk about kind of the iron triangle of product development and design being cost, quality and schedule. And uh, we try to get people to focus on picking two of those. Uh, it's really hard to get all three. Um, so if cost and schedule matter most, um, then quality might have to suffer a little bit. If the quality of the product uh, and schedule matters the most, then I can guarantee you you're going to pay more to hit that, that schedule and that quality bar. Um, you know, as an example, a plastic part for a medical device that's got 5,000 annual units, uh, it's going to take us three weeks to design. That same part for an Xbox that's got 15 million annual, it's going to take us three months to design. The level of optimization is that much different between there. So um, trying to get back and making sure that they are uh, as educated as we can get them and that we can have communicated that as clear as we can and they understand the, the trade-off, then it's their their risk decision to go make great uh question from mark favor you mentioned exponentially increasing costs through the various stages can you give an example of costs of each stage for a given product in development um yeah in rough numbers here um so uh if i just normalize it all and say that uh this product cost a uh, hundred dollars to design and obviously it costs more than that but um, if I go look at that I'm going to go spend 10 to 15 percent of that in my first phase uh, a little bit more in my concepting 20 percent I'm going to spend uh, the remainder almost 50 50 so um, let's say 35 40 percent in each of those last two phases and upon um, how complex it is but uh, it definitely ramps up and it's not obviously exponential but trying to trying to get people to think about where the decisions are made. And if, uh, if we make changes later on, we have to step back and repeat those, those more expensive portions of it. But if I was looking at a typical product like this one, you know, my 
phase one discovery is 10%. My phase two is, you know, 15 to 20 and my phase three and phase four are 50, 50 splits of what's left. So 35% which per cost. That kind of leads into a question we had from uh, Ji Yang. Hope I pronounced that right. Apologies if I didn't. Uh, what is the approximate cost of going through the process you described for a typical consumer product? So we're putting you on the spot a little bit. You can, <laughs> you can define the type of product. Uh, obviously, I'll make the disclaimer for you that this does not apply to your product that you will have Pensar make. But um, if there's any guardrails you can give us to guide our thinking. Um, yeah, that's difficult. Uh, they vary so, so much. Um, trying to see, think about a good example. Um, you know, if I, if I look at some of the handheld devices that are on here from a medical standpoint, you probably have um, a total schedule somewhere in the two and a half to three year range. You probably have uh, 40 to 50 engineers that are client working on it uh six to eight at pensar so obviously our portion of that is dramatically smaller than their portion um in there uh versus you know an xbox that's uh 18 months for us to start to finish doing all mechanicals and electricals and thermals and um, emi whatnot uh it's probably a 12 person team um, but uh Anything like these products that you see, and certainly anything we put out in space, uh, this one here is probably $2 million start to finish-ish, all said and done um, in cost. Um, they're not trivial by any means. Um, question from Salifu Toure. What phase is the most important in developing hardware startups? And you can answer that as it is, but I'd like to, to throw a little bit of an angle on that. Um, I think we're going to have quite a few first-time hardware entrepreneurs, and I wonder if there's a phase that you see as especially critical for first-time folks or a place that uh, first-time entrepreneurs tend to get a little bit more tripped up. I think um, you can do so much right now uh, in hardware during your concepting phase. Um, there are so many breadboards, uh, dev kits, uh, so much opportunity to go uh, – try to mimic what you what you think so the, the product's going to be um, out there so much more than there was you know 20 years ago when we started Pensar um, so you know between uh, using a Raspberry Pi a bunch of dev kits and you know a lab you can make a lot of things from a hardware standpoint behave pretty close to what you think it should be and you can do it really quickly and you can iterate very very quickly um, in that that phase so um, much more excited to see you know this prototype early prototype often um, particularly as we get more tools available to us um, to go do that and try to save the custom schematics the custom pcbs the custom layouts um, until we until we can throw out a lot of the the bad ideas you know, like i said that concept phase i really think about it is we're trying to show you what you don't want um, here's all the things that you asked for we put them all together we use a, a description of a salmon milkshake. Um, client comes to us and they're like, hey, we got this great idea for a product. Uh, everybody's gonna love these salmon milkshakes. So we go off and make a salmon milkshake and it turns out nobody really likes a salmon milkshake. Um, they really wanted vanilla or some other flavor. Um, but until we actually went and built it and tested it and put it in front of somebody, we didn't know that. Um, and so uh, I really like, you know, hardware companies uh, initially that are really focused on how quickly can I turn concepts in a lab um, without getting custom? Um, how, how fast can I go make some changes and, and look at different uh, options that are available to me with all the dev kits and all the, the, the tools that are out there for us today? The solution Does that answer your spin, Brady? Uh, yeah, it does. I, I like okay. the salmon milkshake. I, I mean, not personally, but I like the example. I Nobody guess. likes them, but we get <laughs> asked to make them a lot. <laughs> uh, question from uh, Gil Lund. Uh, how has your company changed with COVID restrictions and having an office in downtown Seattle? I know that um, a lot of folks have been dealing with supply issues and uh, supply chain's not great. Manufacturing is having some issues. I wonder how that's affecting you at Pensar. Um, I think we're really fortunate. Pensar is built 
to work remote. Um, so if you're a, a new engineer at Pensar, uh, you've got a workstation at, at our office, you've got one for your home, um, you've got budget to go create your home office. Um, you know, we want people to be able to work where it's most convenient. If you've got a bad commute, then come in late, come in early, work from home, whatever is most beneficial to your, your personal work-life balance. Um, so for us, uh, you know, we shut down March 6th, um, our office, we've got uh, the top floor of a building right above the ferry terminals, 26,000 square feet, and we shut it down on four hours notice, uh, and we lost maybe three hours of time after that. Um, so we were very fortunate that our network's built for everybody to VPN. It's got all the speed, it's got all the hardware. Uh, we're used to doing that. Um, our labs are still open. Um, they were always, uh, because we do some government contracting work uh, in, our, in our space programs, um, our labs are still open. So there's a lot of equipment that either is too big or for confidentiality reasons can't leave our, our space. So we, we always had, you know, say three or four engineers on average still coming back in and obviously isolating but working in our labs um, and our lab managers um, making sure those spaces were cleaned and, and available and then also doing you know essentially freight forwarding of all the the prototypes and parts that are coming in for folks so um, I think we got off fairly easy and um, you know for the most part we spent a lot of time on teams uh, I think Efficiency wise, uh, we're not quite as fast, you know, when you get onto these online meetings, uh, whether it's Zoom or Teams or whatnot, it's it's not the same as being in person. Uh, it takes longer to get the, the topics covered, uh, brainstorming is harder. So I think we're, we're very functional uh, with the, the COVID issues, but uh, not quite as efficient as we are when we're all together. Makes sense. Uh, we're all a little bit zoomed out. Uh, yeah. Question from Sharik. Sometimes contract manufacturers become your competitors. What's the best way to safeguard your IP? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so uh, for the most part, you know, we see that in, say, tier three, tier four offshore CMs um, that may use your tools that you paid for at night. And, sell their own parts. Um, for a lot of our um, clients that are particularly uh, sensitive to that, um, they end up doing final assembly themselves. Um, parts come from all over, but nobody, nobody has all the pieces. Nobody knows all the information to put it back together. Um, but it's definitely a, a concern, particularly in some of the more easy, great idea consumer electronics where it's really hard to protect that IP. Um, I'll give you an example here of a fun IP issue. So um, in this device, uh, there's a swab that goes into this dark chamber. Um, and that swab, uh, I've got a picture here, is over on the right. Um, and they had, uh, so this is a like a printer, printer cartridge, or a razor, razor blade type of, of product. Um, they sell 2,000 products a year, but they sell uh, 4 million swabs a month. So the, the money is all in the disposable in the swab uh, with the chemical reagents in it. So they had uh, a company knocking off uh, their swabs, uh, costing them about a quarter million dollars a month in revenue. Um, so we ended up um, putting their trademark logo onto the swab and then putting a a camera right here and writing our own algorithm. So as that trademark swab, it's keyed, goes past that camera and we take our, I think 128 pictures that we get of it and we go analyze that. We got to Six Sigma uh, rejection of counterfeit swabs uh, for that. So you can, in some cases, try to design that that out. Um, but definitely, uh, I think the, the folks that suffer the most are the ones that go choose the tier four CMs um, over overseas and um they got the lowest price and they're gonna they're gonna get what they paid for in some way yeah um i think this might be our last question and i like this this is a great tactical question for entrepreneurs uh 
Herman asked, um, what are good sources for buying things needed for your prototype? I'm thinking along the lines of McMaster car, but maybe there's other lesser known ones. You guys are in the middle of everything. I'm sure you see it all. Are there any little hacks that you guys have found? Uh, certainly McMaster car is one of the best websites for searching out there. Um, the quality isn't necessarily there for uh, higher end components that you need, uh, but it's a great first shopping point. Uh, we get boxes in from DigiKey almost every week of all of our electrical components. Um, definitely have uh, a lot of trusted uh, machine shops that we use um, that we go get our, our custom parts from. Same for sheet metal, same for board houses. Um, those relationships matter um, a lot in getting the, the quick turns that we need and the quality that we need for it. Um, and then it, it really gets... Uh, Kind of bracket it out depend upon what you're looking for you know if you're doing a high precision mechanism and you're looking for bearings um, then there's a subset of groups that we go look at if you're uh if you're doing um custom battery work or off the shelf uh, battery packs that you've never heard of uh, there's another subset that we go look in there um and that's all we've got uh approved vendor list at Pensar and you can go search it and, and cross-reference it and try to go find uh, all the comments that other engineers have made about those those vendors. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of initial things that come out of, say, DigiKey and McMaster Car. Um, you may not be able to make the exact version you want from those two places, but you can get pretty close on a lot of things. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, everybody, that's all we have time for. Um, I want to give a big thanks to everybody that attended. This is our, I think, our best attended virtual event yet. And we really appreciate your attending and especially your questions. I know we didn't get to everybody um, and I apologize for that, but everyone just had so many great questions. Um, a big thank you to John and Pensar for uh, sharing the wisdom with the group. And a big thank you to Hans for co-hosting the event. Um, this is the very first talk in our very first series focused entirely on hardware entrepreneurship, uh, which we thought was a fitting way to celebrate the new hardware incubator we're building here at Comotion. Um, tomorrow at 4 p.m., I hope you'll all join me at Hans's event. Uh, join his meetup group, IoT Hub Seattle. If you haven't yet, we'll, we'll be, where we will be hearing from a new player in the 5G space and how startups can start to innovate uh, in that environment. Next week, uh, continuing this series, we'll be hearing from Chrissy Meyer. She's a partner at Root Ventures. She's also an actual hardware investor, which is rare, but I guess they do exist. Uh, and she'll be talking about business models for hardware startups. Sign up for that, and we'll see you all next week. Again, thank you all for joining, and please reach out if you want to talk about the new incubator that we're building. Um, I'm going to throw my email address in the chat again, and I would love to talk to anybody who has something to tell me. Thanks, everybody.